You're listening to Journalists on Journalism, a weekly podcast brought to you by Stanford's Graduate Program in Journalism. For more information and upcoming speakers, visit journalism.stanford.edu. It's hard to have your own voice in, in the world of, of magazine journalism. The nation is really quite exceptional in the freedom that it gives its writers, um, and um, which is both political and literary in every conceivable way. I'm, I'm really happy there, um, and, and hope never to leave. Um, <laughs> There is a challenge, if you write a column for any length of time, there is always the challenge of uh, keeping it fresh and interesting, not just for the readers, in fact, less for the readers, because many readers are happy if you say the same thing every time. They think that's good, that's like showing that you really think those things, right? Um, uh, but for yourself, to keep it, to keep it challenging. Uh, the real reason why the women's magazines are so terrible is that they're mass market magazines that are edited by extremely intelligent, highly educated women for an audience that is uh, less uh, educated and sophisticated. And so they have contempt for their readers. These magazines are read, they're, they're read in what they call an aspirational way, like people read magazines that are uh, pitched at a higher uh, class level than they themselves are. It's just like when there was Seventeen magazine. Seventeen-year-olds didn't read Seventeen. Fifteen-year-olds read Seventeen mm. to find out what it was like to be Seventeen. <laughs> and it's the same sort of thing. All of these, <laughs> these editors are they're constantly worried that they're going to offend their readers who are much more conservative than they themselves are, who are more provincial, who are less educated, um, who they feel they are, bring, they are educating them and they're bringing them along. So if they write an article about, um, you know, birth control, for them that's a big step. They're educating women about birth control and, and they feel that's a really humanitarian and altruistic thing to do. And that justifies what they're doing to themselves. But there's only one article like that in, you know, among all the rest which is all about the advertising and making them, people feel so anxious they'll buy the next issue <coughs> and all the rest of it. So it's a very horrible tangle. It would be terrible if it turned out that, uh, you know, editors decided, you know, we can't send, we can't send a woman. Besides being very unfair to the women themselves, who are really the best determinants of how much risk they want to take, um, and besides whether there are maybe ways in which one can minimize these risks, that you know, now that the discussion is on the table, could be talked about, and there are also men who get assaulted and men who get murdered, who are who are foreign correspondents, um, and nobody's saying, well, don't send men. I mean, you've got to send somebody, right? Um, but the other piece of it is, I think there are stories, especially in conservative Muslim countries, or conserv not just Muslim, but conservative countries, that only women can tell. Only women can interview women in some of those cultures. Only women can see certain aspects of society that men are not allowed to see. Um, and only women, I think, I think this is an area in which women really probably have a more subtle and sophisticated understanding of uh, of gender-related things, and that's a really important story that needs to be told. So if you don't send women, you don't get that story. I'm very happy with my job. I hope you all get columns. Um, <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful life, and, um, uh, um, and that's, um, that's about all I have to say about it. You've been listening to Journalists on Journalism. Find more speakers at journalism.stanford.edu.